stone has a great sense of dignity and a sense of time that's built within it. You start with something that's just a square edge and you know you finish it and make it look nice and um, it's a lot of work you know it obviously takes longer than wood because it's harder. It's kind of satisfying to make it something nice out of just a chunk of stone you know. The case in Vermont here what made these marbles is the collision of things to the edge of our continent, you know, adding more rocks from these volcanic island chains that are pushing in and then smashing the other continent into it. That gives you the ability to take surface rocks and put them at depth where they can change and be metamorphosed. Then later on it's going to provide you with good mechanisms to erode all the rocks off the top of the pile because we've got these big mountain ranges, deep rivers are cutting down through it and then we rip the whole thing apart and, and, the, and the mountain range is going to fall apart after that and, and erode to its current kind of you know, rounded off in, in not very high elevation state. The earliest settlers there's outcrop holes on, on hills and, and they, they just started using it for various king uh, gravestones and so it, it, that's how it started really. The sad thing about the marble is when you go up through Wallingford, there's a place where they make gravel which used to be where the purple and the salmon colored marble came from, but they ran out most of it. That used to be where all the fancy, fancy colors from. Yeah. Big quarry, that's, that's sure. the reason the Italians bought it was it's got all the white and the wrap. They've run out of the white in Italy, of the good white. If, if I, as a geologist, walk into a new area, one of the first things I'm going to do is, is go into creeks and look at what sort of boulders and, and cobbles are deposited in those creeks, because that's going to give me one of the first clue as to like what are all the types of rocks that are up in these mountains that these rivers and streams are draining from. If I walk into a creek and I see a whole bunch of marble, I'm saying somewhere upstream there's going to be marble. If you've got the stuff you want, from there on out, it kind of becomes an engineering consideration of how hard is it going to be to get out of the ground at any this, at this particular spot. Um, the rock that you find on the ground or any outcropping of rock, you're going to see fractures in it. We call them joints. Now, if you're trying to build a big steep-sided hole and you have a whole bunch of fractures that are dipping into your quarry, you're going to have a problem because you're going, to, you're going to have slope stability issues where you might have landslides of these particular rocks that are being mobilized along these fractures that dip into your excavation. Now, so you're going to want to orient the walls of your excavation so the major fracture systems dip away from it. And uh, raw water might be flowing through your system could be another issue because that also determines a large part of slope stability and then water removal from your excavation is a big issue how much water you actually have to pump out of it every single day. Geology, uh, they, what happens if they got a direction they want to go and they don't know what it is, what the marble looks like, so they bring a core drill crew in. They can drill core samples out of it. And then they would look at the core samples and determine whether the marble's good or not, and then they can go that way. I did. Ask myself, I was like, what the heck are you doing in here? Every time they blast, that's when you ask yeah, yourself. Yeah, that's when you ask yourself, because they really would shake the place up. <laughs> I got used to it after a while, you know, and I went on to do the blasting. So you just kept going. Keep going, you drop down, but you always got a face after that, you know what I mean? No matter which way. Like here, if you want, right there in Proctor, they used to have a carving studio, I mean, carving section right there. That's where they made all them big pillars and stuff, they would carve them. Do them basically a uh, slab, you know, and different sizes. We have a machine that does the slab, but it'll also do carving. No, I never got the hammer and chisel off. <laughs> of course, back then, you know, they had, between the three shifts, they had like 230-something something guys working here. Now you got 20 all, all, all together. together. Five or six? Five. Five, five I think. Five on nights. I mean, we still sell block form to whoever wants it. Marble, what we would call the hardness of marble is fairly low because calcite is not a very hard mineral, it's easy to scratch. And that's one of the things that makes marble such a good stone to be using for sculpture or, or buildings because it's very, very easy to you know, work it and mill it into the shape that you want. We're, we're a good uh, 
I remember the Ambrosini brothers. They were, they were two of the best. They were imported from Italy. We sent agents out there to, to get uh, carvers. Uh, Ambrosinis, they worked for God after they got done with the marble company. Right. One of them just recently died. They lived to be 97, 98 years old. I, I knew both of them. A lot of stone cutters came from Italy. They were good at it because that's, uh, marble was a big thing in Italy. Italian marble was, was, it was cheaper to, to import here on the ship that used it as ballast and uh, the competition was great, but at one time this town was booming. It was, yeah. it was considered uh, one of the richest in the state of Vermont. Marble is actually much more porous and does start to show the effects of time and weather. And that the color slightly changes over time, just as we human beings change over time. Part of it is that it's very solid, it's very real and you lay the stone and you know it's going to stay there and you know it's going to be there and you've made a mark on the world and that's a good mark. Proctor family took over all these small marble companies. They, uh, they turned things around and, and did a great job of it. At one time there were five or six different marble companies. They had marble sheds all over the place until uh, Mr. Proctor, then they got in politically in the Montpelier, the Proctors were governors and, Drill rigs that could collect good samples did exist back then. Uh, they didn't go as quick, they weren't as cheap to operate as the ones we have today, but yeah, they could, they could drill, they could get pretty good samples. They used different techniques, but they could do it. The supervisor would teach them how to do it. It was mostly manual work, uh, operating the gang that was cutting marble. It was the idea of setting the saw, so they would cut straight, keeping it tight. Uh, they would pound the pens in to keep the steel tight to cut straight. And the channeling machine was a simple operation down in the quarry. It was, it was a series of drills that just keep drilling down and getting the, then the block would be popped out with wedges. It wasn't the same. My, my grandfather was the, the chief marble expert for Vermont Marble. So he was responsible for um, determining whether the marble was suitable for use. Well, he was a self-taught geologist. Yeah. Um, just, just learned from the old school. Um, never, you know, like I said, never dropped, finished high school in eighth yeah. grade, or never made the high school. Right. And um, but just, just learned from the old timers, and and, um, and and had an act for it and picked it up. And, yeah. I'd have to go back to my great grandparents, which were actually marble workers. Uh, one was an Italian and one was French, and they were marble mm -hmm. workers. My grandmother's father was a carver. My great-grandfather was, I think he actually polished marble because he worked with Herb's grandfather. My parents were immigrants from Poland. They came here about 19, 19, 1995, I believe. And uh, they worked in the, my father was a marble worker. He, he was sponsored by a cousin of his. What would the marble company do without these immigrants coming in? You know, throughout the country, and not only here, but throughout the United States, uh, you know, they, they, they built this country. That's why they provided uh, uh, homes for them, because, you know, they needed them. Of course, they said that. I think there were 28 or 29 different nationalities in Proctor. There was uh, the Irish, the French, Italian, Swedish, mm. Lithuanian, Hungarian, mm. Uh, there were seven, and there was a Jewish community here, too. As children, we, that was our playground. We used to go down in the first quarry and go down through the tunnels and come out in the last quarry. <laughs> you know, the children used to play around there, jump from block pile to block pile. Skating every day in the winter, and swimming in the summer, but the sports, especially basketball, put all the different nationalities together on the team. They had their own Polish orchestra. They had a Polish marching band at one time. And the priest, you know, he would, if the celebration went too far, he would go over there and the first thing he'd do, he'd tell the accordion player to get lost. Those are Proctor people who were in the band anyway. Yeah, Silberg, his family had the um, creamery. My mother used to save the cream, the, the, uh, the milk. And we'd go down a quarry and get a block of ice. The, the girls would pick some strawberries and my mother would make two quarts of ice cream every other Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> 
one side of the coin they they provided housing there was uh, there was 117 duplex homes one time and there was four that had four tenants and there was one that had eight tenements so you see they uh, they provided the, the company store the living quarters but on the other hand they 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 underpaid the, the quarry worker worked 10 hours for a dollar and a half or two dollars a day and one on one hand they were very good to the work on the other hand i think mm -hmm. we they were shortchanged as a result there were several strikes in the beginning they they didn't call them unions they called them some type of organization mm -hmm. but the last strike in 1935 there was some local from Barrie. that was a, a strike that uh, caused a great division in the community. Oh. Basically, it was a, a, an attempt to, and they weren't asking for too much, and the, the marble company was bound and determined that they were going to break the strike. They hired deputies from that uh, were here to break up the strike, and, and they eventually did. Like my father, he was a striker, and and it became difficult. In the end, uh, you know, there was no wages. Uh, I had sisters that were good students. They become dropouts to help out in the family. My brother Charlie went into the CC camp to, mm -hmm. to help out, and I felt sorry for the the children of the strikers because they were a, a strike breaker was called a scab. And in school they say, "Ah, your father was a scab," you know. And I the marble company didn't provide the protection that they do today. Hard hats. Now there wasn't a hard hat down in the quarry. A piece of marble as big as my hand would kill you. There were a lot of fatalities there. One one bad year, 1898, I think it was, seven seven marble workers died that one year. The mother would become a widow with, with five or six kids, and there was no welfare in them days. Here he is right here. Here's Fletcher Proctor. He was the president of the company from when Redfield Sr. went to Washington in 1890, oh. and he was until he died in 1911. So he was, and he was president during a very prosperous time. Eventually, they uh, closed down the shops. There's, there's still a lot of marble in West Australia. It's all filled in with water. There's a lot of marble in this area as yet, and it's a shame because I, I thought maybe Omnia would buy up the place over here and continue uh, extracting marble, but it didn't happen. The, a lot of the families moved out. Some of the Italians went to, well, Albany was a good area. Mechanicsville, New York. Our neighbors, the Degandys, they went to Patterson, New Jersey. So we looked around and saw the sort of tradition of these white buildings in a green landscape. It seemed as if this white color would be the right choice. And it's the first time we've actually ever worked uh, cladding a building in marble. We've always used granite. So it's both our first marble building and our first white building, although it's white in many colors. So it really has to do with looking around and seeing what's here in Vermont. Stone is something that runs in families. So whether you're selling it, whether you're taking the stone out of the ground, or whether you're laying the stone, stone people just love looking at stone and touching the stone and working the stone. father and another gentleman actually started this business back in 81, and we, we, I, I, I started working for them from day one. All the machines uh, were once belonged to the Vermont Marble, and um, they, some of them came with the business. When, when they, my father and his, and his partner actually bought this business from Vermont Marble. A lot of our marble comes in a rough slab, which then we have to put on our polishing machines and either polish it or hone it. So there's, there's a few different stages there. Sometimes we get cubic where there's a thick block and if we have to make, a, let's say, a, a gravestone or something, that's the same type of deal. We, we, we have to put them on our machines and put the finish on that they want. Over time you just learn how much you need to do. So when you start out you would dry it off after each step and check it. And that's how you learn. Stone is different too. Pretty much, just you gotta get experience. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Just do it. I do make mistakes. <laughs> My biggest thing I had the most trouble with was trying to stay off the surface while doing the edges because you don't want to scratch the surfaces, and it takes a while to get that down. And he had me polishing, run the grit machine, and every step you have to make sure you bottom every step out. So you gotta get used to it. It's amazing how it, you know, we're, 
it starts, it's in the ground. Yeah. And it's, it's just hard to believe they can take that out of the ground and turn it into a, a headstone or a, a countertop or whatever. It's, it's, it's quite a process. The customer has a certain color that they want, and you know, it's pretty important sometimes to them to get the right color, you know. Probably the most popular is the Danby Imperial. People like to mix it up and throw in a few of the other types. I don't think it'll ever come back the way it used to be. But it's still, it's still going strong. And, it's um, just smaller, but there's, there's always going to be a cow for some uses of stone. If it wasn't for the marble industry, most of us probably wouldn't be here now, you know. Before they filled up with water, you'd get a good strong north wind. And the, the series of those quarries, they, they'd act like a, like a huge flute. The wind would come into one mm. quarry, come out the other, and make an awful weird No, That's why some of the people that lived over there on Baxter Street, they, they say that there was ghosts down there. People that got killed in the quarry are... <laughs> My name is uh, Red Sutkowski. I'm 89 years old. I was born and brought up in West Scotland, other than, uh, other than being in the service in World War II for four years. I resided in West Scotland all these years. There were a lot less trees here because of the logging and the agriculture. And so you would have seen a lot more of these rocks exposed. They would have been much, not so much like hidden under this big vegetation canopy. It's beautiful. Like the stoops on these old buildings, oh, it's just beautiful, beautiful stuff. I used to use uh, half round and wedges, plug and feather, for right. breaking. Put them in there and used to have guys get down through and hit it with a sledgehammer. Hit the wedge. You have a whole roll of them on a, on a layer. You keep hitting it until it put enough pressure until it broke. My name is Billy Chen and I am partners with Todd Williams, who is uh, also my husband, so we're doubly partners. And we have a studio in New York City, and we are the architects who are working on this project for Bennington College. I mean, this is all the center of the town. It was all filled, all filled with wow. marble. If you dig down there four or five feet, you're going to see but marble. Center of the town, yeah. So here is the hospital. This really, originally, was the isolation ward. Scarlet fever, oh, oh, contagious right. diseases. It came out of the um, wages. Maybe, maybe this was the insurance for that. Helping another guy over here do the installations for her. He had another guy that left and moved to California. And uh, he needed help and he asked me if I wanted a job. And I started working. It took a little while to catch on to it. <laughs> 